Some of my all-time favorite commanders come from the Ravnica block, and the commander that actually inspired me to play EDH in the first place, Niv-Mizzet Perun, also resides there. Niv-Mizzet is a powerhouse of a commander, and the steep casting cost is just another indication of how strong he really is. Uncounterable, strong stat lines, it draws you cards and pings for damage, a win condition all in one. And this is stapled onto a legendary dragon that's described as the oldest and most cunning being on the plane of Ravnica. What's not to like? Unfortunately, this particular iteration of Niv-Mizzet has quite a reputation, has even filtered in and out of competitive circles for just how strong this guy can be. Your playgroup will likely target you for playing this commander, but if they don't, they will soon find out why it's absolutely necessary to do so. Let's break down exactly how this commander's triggered ability works. So this is the bread and butter of what we're gonna be doing with this deck, and I wanna make sure that everyone is on the same playing field before we move into the rest of the video. So let's say that I have Nimizid on the battlefield and I cast an Opt. So because we've cast an Opt, that goes on the stack, but so does our commander's second triggered ability, which allows us to draw a card for casting an instant or sorcery. So before the Opt even resolves, we draw off of Nimizid's ability. But because we drew, that will trigger our commander's first ability, which allows us to deal one damage to something, which allows us to ping something. And I'm gonna be using the word ping throughout the rest of the video, just because it's gonna be easier for us moving forward. So there you go. So we get to deal one damage to any target. That's right, any target. How crazy is that? Then the opt resolves, allowing us to draw off of the opt. But because we drew again, we get to ping something again with Nib Mizzet. And you can see how just this simple cantrip produces a ton of value for us. A single opt in this example has drawn us two cards and dealt two damage to anything of our choice. But let's make this a bit more complicated. Let's say that we are casting our opt and then the second triggered ability of Nib Mizzet goes on the stack to draw a card. And for some unforeseen reason, our opponent decides that yes, they're gonna counterspell our opt. So counterspell now enters the stack thanks to the magic of video editing. You can see that here. But something incredible happens. Because they cast a counterspell, we get a second instance of Nib Mizzet's ability to draw a card because Nib Mizzet does not just care about us casting instants and sorceries, he cares about all players casting instants and sorceries. So we get to draw as long as priority passes. And let's say that we draw into a counter spell. We can then use that to counter the counter spell on our opt, which I don't know why we would, but let's say that we do. That allows us to draw a card and then we get our opt to resolve and all is well in the world. And you can see how it becomes really important to understand how things land on the stack. In these counterspell wars, which you will get to at some point, you really need to pay attention to Niv's triggered ability to draw you a card and the subsequent ability for him to ping something because you might just draw into an answer to the next spell that's on the stack. And this gets even more important when you reach higher levels of play. Top decking a fierce guardianship to counter someone's demonic consultation is a much bigger deal than someone trying to counterspell our opt. Don't overcomplicate his abilities. It's actually quite simple once you understand how the stack works. I decided to put this at the front of the video because as a new player, and I was there once, I just didn't really understand what exactly the stack was doing. I just knew something powerful was happening. Oftentimes I would just resolve it all at once. Typically it would be after the spell was cast or before, depending on what I felt or what seemed like fit the situation best. And that is completely incorrect. Do not do that at your table. But why is niv Mizzet so infamous? Why do people playing against him hate this commander? Partially, it's what I already mentioned. He draws you a ton of cards, so you're often gonna have answers and you're gonna draw a ton of hate as a result. But even more terrifying is you drawing into one of your win conditions, such as Ophidian Eye, Curiosity, or Tandem Lookout. Even these are not created equal and is something that you wanna keep in mind moving forward. I remember the very first time I cast Curiosity on niv Mizzet. I was actually in this very room about two years ago that I did so, and I cast my next instant to draw my card. niv Mizzet pinged my opponent's face and I was playing one-on-one, -on -one, which, you know, it, admittedly not, not very fair, but nonetheless, I was playing one-on-one. -on -one. And it dawned on me that I entered into my very first infinite loop in Magic the Gathering. And that's because Curiosity and also Ophidian Eye have the same text, which reads, whenever this enchanted creature deals damage to an opponent, you may draw a card. Not just combat damage, any damage. And Niv-Mizzet will continuously cycle through your deck to your heart's content. Ophidian Eye and Curiosity are essentially the same because they use the word may, meaning that you can stop your infinite loop at any time. Tandem Lookout, on the other hand, is not so forgiving. And 
it's a similar ability, but there is no May ability, meaning that if you allow it to just continuously cycle through, you will eventually deck yourself out unless you have some way to stop it before the next resolution of the ability. So be very mindful when you include these different types of infinite loops in your niv deck. So with all this in mind, you can really see the heart and soul of our commander decks start to take shape. We stick niv early, and then we start profiting off of our cheap spells, which is almost certainly the way to go. But what about creatures? And in this deck, all of the creatures had to fight for their spot. In a Spellslinger deck, there's generally two different avenues that we can take when focusing on our creatures. One is token production, and the other is a symmetrical burn type effect. And in the many hundreds of games, you heard that right, I've played hundreds of games of niv -Mizzet. I found that I rarely needed the token producers for my plan to succeed. I would have much, much rather had a symmetrical burn effect like a psychosis crawler because that assists in us not decking ourselves out. The token producers acted more as an insurance policy. And I often felt like if I just had a different card in the slot, I would have been happier or perhaps I would have had a more consistent game plan. In the other scenario where I end up with a bunch of tokens, but I never get a chance to actually use them because niv Mizzet overrides that anyway. Eventually I just hit my combo and I never have to use the tokens. So I didn't really need these and I ended up cutting these in our regular version of the deck. Some of our most important cards are actually mana producers, such as Stormkiln Artist, which I would argue is probably the best, Urabrask, and of course, Bergy. Now, all of these are excellent includes because they're replacing the mana that we just spent. But we do have to be careful not to include too many cards with blue pips, especially mono blue pips, because Bergy and Urabrask only care about red mana. But I think that both are good enough to include here. And for a similar reason to Bergy and Urabrask, we also have to be careful about including Baral Chief of Compliance or Goblin Electromancer automatically. Now, these only reduce the colorless portion of the mana of our instants and sorceries. So what if we only have five to 10 instants or sorceries with some kind of colorless requirement? Well, it basically means that these are gonna be duds in our deck 99% of the time. So be very careful before you just assume that it sounds good, you just auto include it. You don't always have to do that. Yet another reason to not include a Reliquary Tower or a Thought Vessel, if you even needed another reason, is Glinthorn Buccaneer. So this card has infinite combos with our Curiosity and also the Aphidian Eye, just in a more roundabout way. So let's say that our card draw is built up, we're over our legal hand size, and we have the Buccaneer on the battlefield equipped with Curiosity. So let's just say we have 10 in hand, and during our cleanup step, which is at our end step, we discard three because we have to meet our legal hand size limit. And then this triggers the Buccaneer three separate times for each discard. But then on each damage that the Buccaneer deals, we will be drawing an additional card. So once the stack is empty, we go back into another cleanup step because we are over the legal hand limit, having to discard three more. And subsequently you cycle this endlessly until you're killing the table. I mean, you're just gonna kill the table. As long as we have more than 50 or so cards in our deck, this will burn out pretty much every single opponent. And there's certainly an argument to run other cards over the Buccaneer, but having another easy win condition in the deck also doubles to help us protect ourselves in the event that Niv-Mizzet gets removed time and time again. And I really don't like the Thoracle, the Thassa's Oracle, or the Lab Maniac win conditions. I think that those are best reserved for the highest level of play, and even as a standalone CEDH deck, I don't necessarily think that Niv-Mizzet benefits substantially from including those cards. Let's talk about Ramp. Normally I auto-include things like Soul Ring, but if we review our current deck list, the number of colorless mana needed is actually quite low. Not to mention the slot that Soul Ring takes up can be filled by a card that produces some type of colored mana. After all, niv it requires three pips of blue and red, and the Soul Ring generally doesn't help us get there. In my various games with Niv, I found that I never once regretted cutting Soul Ring. I think it just makes you even more of a target than you already are for an extremely low payoff in 99% of circumstances. And for that reason, we've included a lot of colored mana producers and in the more expensive version of the deck, Jeweled Lotus, because quite frankly, Niv is screaming for us to include this card. In fact, he's the very first commander I think of when I think of Jeweled Lotus. He is the core of our strategy and having him out three turns early will often just end the game. And if you want a more balanced game, I will have a budget deck list available in the description below that doesn't have the fast mana like the Jeweled Lotus. And just as a little aside, I threw this in as a bonus for you. I mentioned Thought Vessel before. I would really encourage you to not run Thought Vessel. It produces colorless mana and it also doesn't 
synergize very well with our current deck list, which also incorporates Glinthorn Buccaneer. So just cut that card out of your deck. It's absolutely not necessary. And on the topic of artifacts, you might notice that I've not included the Swiftfoot Boots or Lightning Greaves in our list. And why is that? Well, the Greaves are a tricky one because the Greaves give us Shroud, which means that we cannot actually target our commander especially with our game-winning effects like Curiosity or Ophidian Eye. And this is a complete non-bow in my opinion. I would much rather just avoid the awkward scenario where we miss a win because I can't target our commander. And unfortunately, it's happened to me. Don't let it happen to you. What's more, look at our creature density. There's a very real chance that Nidmizzet will be the only creature on the board, and we're unfortunately unable to remove the Greaves once they've been equipped. So this just leads to feel bad situations where we miss wins left and right if Nidmizzet is equipped and he's the only creature on the battlefield. And as far as the Swift of Boots are considered, we're running various free counter magic in our deck to support our strategy. And this extra artifact doesn't necessarily do anything additional for us in the way that an instant or sorcery would. So for that reason, I would much rather rather just run another free counter spell or more counter magic rather than the swift foot boots. And speaking of an extra instant, look at the density of our instant and sorcery spells. It makes me a very happy man. We have 37 instants and or sorceries, and that means that not only will we reliably draw into them and our other spells to trigger our commander, but we're apt to draw into something that will draw us even further, often resulting in a large portion of our deck being drawn throughout the course of the game. And I would say that even in my games where I didn't win with Nimizit, I tend to get through 30 to 50% of my deck organically, meaning without his ability directly. And this is the power of draw spells in our deck. It's also the reason that I fell in love with Is It Spell Slinger because I feel that I'm always at least doing something. And when my back is against the wall, there's always a real chance that I'm gonna draw into some type of answer because in the manner in which that I build the deck. I don't think that we need to beat a dead horse. Niv is powerful. But what if we wanted to take a step down so our friends won't stop playing with us? Well, play at your own risk, but the budget version of Niv Mizzet is crazy good for $150. In fact, if you simply remove some of the untapped dual lands, I think that you could build this deck for around 100 US dollars without issue. And that $100 will be spent on a deck that will win you games, not just some dud that spins its wheels without affecting the board state. Some of the key highlights here are the Locust God, which acts as a backup commander in the event our dragon gets removed too many times. And I'd also like to draw your attention to Delay, which is just a stud of a counterspell. I seriously think that more people need to have this on their radar. For one blue and a generic, you counter any spell. But what's more, it goes into exile with time counters, three time counters. So all of those graveyard decks can say goodbye to their win condition being placed in the yard. And in a pinch, it's not bad when used on a commander, even though it'll simply go back to the command zone. I'm also a huge fan of Bolt Bend as a budget replacement for Deflecting Swat. One red most of the time just to Deflecting Swat something is still a pretty good rate. And finally, a card that I'm coming around on is Jace's Sanctum. This guy is just great. And it's great because it triggers at the same time our commander does, meaning we can stack our triggers so the Sanctum resolves first, scrying before our draw of nib -Mizzet. Say goodbye to flooding out on lands and say hello to simply gas. Did I mention that this is also a cost reducer? If you aren't is a guild mage, I hope that this video did some type of job to convince you to become one. My very first video was about this commander and with the release of Ravnica Remastered, I figured that many of you may be inspired to build some of these classic commanders, niv -Mizzet included. Be sure to check out both deck lists down in the description below, and I promise that you'll have a good time playing both lists. They are very similar to the list that I had initially upon making my very first deck. And if you stuck around to this portion of the video, this one's for you. Thank you. Seriously, you must be crazy to stick around to this point in the video, or maybe I'm actually doing a good job. And if you think that I am, then please consider subscribing to show your support. It's really the best way if you want to keep seeing more videos just like this one. I also can't believe this happened within the last week, but I have a brand new logo and also a banner that was completed. Um, I wanted something that really represented the Tempest more so than what I have already had. I used an artist on Fiverr, his name is Unreal Bird, it'll be linked down in the description and also on screen right now. His real name is Thomas, he's an Indonesian artist and he was extremely pleasant to work with. He was also very professional. So if you're in the market for something in a similar style, go check him out and support his page. Finally, I've had numerous people ask me to start a Discord because they want to either send me photos or ask me questions directly. The people have asked and I have answered. You can see the description for my brand new Discord down below. And if you are a deck builder, I would encourage you to join to help others who are in search of some constructive and intelligent feedback. As always, support my addiction so I can continue supporting your addiction. 
I've been Kyle and I'll see you guys in the next video. Bye.